In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Though our sins are scarlet, you've made us white as snow. Though our sins are scarlet, you've made us white as snow. to speak some of God's good word. And our subject for this evening is the greatest thing that can be said about a Christian. The greatest thing that can be said about a Christian. Now, there are many good things that you can say about good Christians. And I've often said that the heroes of my life are not the preachers that I've met. And I have met some very wonderful and fine preachers who could not only preach well, but were tremendous men and uh, who were great Christians uh, with it. But the uh, greatest people I do believe that I have ever met in my life are people that I pastored, and I've come to know them. I have seen them go through the fire. I have seen them stand under the bludgeonings of chance and circumstance. And yet, victory was their lot. And I appreciate that so much. They've been such an inspiration to me. Back in the year of 1968, I went to Bemis and was there for part of a week. Uh, they had uh, rented for me a motel, which it was commoditious and had uh, adequate desk space. I brought dictating equipment alone and did uh, uh, my work while I was there. This was the arrangement that Brother George Glass made for me and said, I'll see that you have a private secretary and that you have a private place to do your work if you will just come and do your work in Bemis and that you will uh, preach at night. And so we did. It wasn't long. In fact, at that time, he said, Brother Pugh, the desire of my heart is to go into the evangelistic work. I want to be out and go from church to church and I want to preach. And he did. Later on, after he had been out on the field for about three years, I met him again. And I said, did you enjoy the evangelistic work? He said, yes, I did. I most certainly did enjoy the evangelistic work. And he said, I met such wonderful people. And he said, Brother Pugh, the thing that came to me while I was out there and in different churches and I was meeting such wonderful people is this. I wish that I had a way out of all of these churches I've been in and all of these good Christians that I've met. If I could pick out 100 of the very best ones that I have met in the process of the three years and bring them to a certain 
place and I could begin with them and put together a mighty work for God, what a wonderful thing that would be if I could just take my pick of the best 100 that I met in the last uh, three years. I've often wondered what would be his criteria. The rule of judgment that Brother Glass would use if he picked out the very best Christians and saints that he had met over a three-year period. Well, would it be people that had talent? That's important. And I appreciate so much the talent that is here in this church because there's a lot of it here. And I really do appreciate it. Would it be finance? That is important. I thank God for the selflessness that is manifested on the part of people here in this assembly. And I thank God for that. Would it be uh, just witnesses, people that would speak their peace for God and reach out to the lost? And this everybody should do. Now, I know that that is important. And all that I've said is important. And I'm thinking that that might be one of the considerations of Brother Glass. But one thing I've left out. I have not mentioned one important thing yet, and perhaps the most important thing, in selecting perhaps the very best Christian that you possibly could. The greatest thing that could be said about any Christian. It doesn't matter what, bar none, you can't say anything better than that. What is the greatest thing that could be said about any Christian? That is one of the most important parts of a Christian's life, and that is faithfulness. Let's all say faithfulness. Faithfulness. Let's say it again. Faithfulness. Now, that's not only important in spiritual matters. That's important, as you well know, in material matters, too, that a person is faithful. You take a talented worker, a person that can do their job real well, and maybe they can turn out quite a bit of work, and whatever work they do is well done. You don't have to go back over and do it again. But suppose that that worker, whoever they are, is not faithful. Suppose that they just simply, you can't depend on them. You can't put much stock in them. You don't know whether they're going to be there or not. You don't know whether they're going to come late or not come at all. Now, I have talked to some men who have employed people before and have had to work with people, and invariably this kind of feedback comes to me. I just tell you they do a good job with what they do, but you just can't depend on them. And then often I have heard this, uh, this, uh, uh, this particular observation. When the going gets tough and when the jobs get slow and when it comes late off time, these are the first folks that go, are the ones that you can't depend upon. Above talent, above ability, above all of that seems to be with those folks that work people under them, this ingredient that you call faithfulness. Somebody that you can depend on that's going to be there. Rain, shine, sleet, or snow, that they are going to be there. That's important as far as a worker's concerned. That's important as far as a partner in life is concerned, a companion, a husband, or wife. Some years ago, and it hasn't been too many years ago, in fact, it's been since I've been in Odessa, I had the very heart-rendering uh, duty of counseling and trying to sustain a particular uh, person in the Lord uh, that uh, was attempting to live for God, a brother a faithful brother and a good man who is still living for God. This man's wife uh, decided that she did not want to be faithful. Now, according to this man's testimony, she was a good cook. He said to me, Pastor, she is a good cook, and said she is a good housekeeper. I can take you to my house when my wife is there, and everything is in order. She keeps it in order. She takes care of my clothes. And he said, when I come in, I know that I'm going to have a good meal, and everything is going to be fine. Said that she does that all right. She sees to it that my breakfast is ready. She sees to it that uh, that I have a good meal. She sees to it that the house is clean. She sees to it that my clothes are clean. And then when she started being unfaithful, and I talked to her about that, she can't understand it. 
She says, am I not keeping the house? Yes. Or am I not cooking? Yes. Am I not washing your clothes? Yes. And all of this. And she said, well, what's the big deal? All that is wrong here is I'm just unfaithful. And I, you don't know when I'm going to come in at night and so on. I do everything. And that's just the only thing. I'm just not faithful. And uh, it seems like that that would be all right. The man could not adjust himself to that. He said, I have begun to feel dirty because I don't know who she's out with at night. And I have no idea. I feel very unclean just living with her and living in that environment. I know that regardless of what time of night that she comes in, and most often it's in the wee hours of the morning, she will get up and she will have my breakfast. She will be smiling and she wants me to smile and so on. And he said, I feel filthy and I feel dirty. And this is the reason why and the only reason why that Jesus Christ himself gave a person the, uh, the privilege, the option of divorcing somebody that continued a promiscuous life. For Paul himself said, He that is joined to a harlot is the same as one with the harlot, because that uh, they have become no longer twain, and, and so on. To uh, remove a person, the innocent party, from such uncleanness. But all was wrong was just unfaithfulness. The greatest ingredient it seems in any Christian's life is this thing that we call faithfulness. Faithfulness. It seems imparted on the job. It seems imparted in a marriage. It seems uh, to be imparted. It's imparted as far as parents are concerned. There is a certain routine that ought to be in a home. Children ought to be able to anticipate and expect certain things. There are certain traditional things that go well with rearing a family. When children can expect certain things to happen every day. I can remember my children coming in from school when they were young. I've been at the house lots of times when the front door would open and I would hear footsteps about the house and then I would hear a pause and that particular child would be listening. Sometimes it was Data, sometimes Terry, sometimes Nathaniel. And in a moment's quietness, their voice would be lifted up. Mother! And silence. Mother! And then I would change my voice and I would say, Yes! <laughs> and uh, But when they found if their mother was there, just the matter of coming and saying a word to them, and just to know that she was there and everything seemed to be all right. We used to have hamburgers on Saturday, every Saturday, homemade hamburgers. And what is better than homemade hamburgers with two good thick slices of onion on them? You eat that and you can blow them down. That's right. I, and, and so we used to have that every Saturday. And that was traditional. That uh, there's some things uh, that go with faithfulness. That there are certain things that happen at our house. Things you can count on. Things that have a particular routine that leaves you with a sense of security. This is another way of just simply saying dependability and faithfulness. Now the scripture stresses that too. Matthew 25 and 21. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Luke 19 and 17. If you have been faithful in a few things, He will make you ruler over many. Luke 16 and 10. He that is faithful in that which is least, well, He will be given charge, the Scripture tells us, of much more. 1 Corinthians 4 and 12. Moreover, it is required of a steward that he be found faithful. That's one thing that if he's going to handle money, it, he is going to be in charge of affairs. He must be faithful. Revelation 2 and 10, Be thou faithful unto death. Faithful unto death. Second Timothy, uh, Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. There's a certain disposition of 
faithfulness, predictability. You could know what that man was going to do, the position he would take, his response on given things, because he was, his life was ordered in a righteous direction. God is faithful. The Scripture tells us that He is. Now, you don't find that true with pagan gods. I have traveled in lands of of the sea in different places. I have seen altars to various gods. And uh, most of the time, it was an effort to appease this god because the gods of the pagans are moody creatures and you can't predict the mood that they're going to be in at a particular time. So it is always an appeasement to cajole them and to keep them in a good frame of mind. But that is not true with the great Jehovah God. The Bible tells us that He is faithful. He is faithful in His character. We can depend upon Him in principle. We know that He will live and respond in a certain way. And there's nothing to worry about there. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, He is. In uh, your relationship with an individual, if that individual is unpredictable, you don't know whether they're going to be uptight, whether they're going to be sour, whether they're going to be sunny, whether they're going to be agreeable, whether they're going to be mean, and so on. It makes you uncomfortable. But the people that you are comfortable with are the folks that are dependable, that are steady. And the Bible tells me that my Savior is like that. When I come and talk to him in the morning, I will find him to be just like he was when I last spoke to him. Because he does not change. He is faithful. 2 Timothy 2.15, the Bible tells us that he abideth faithful. I can depend upon him. 1 Thessalonians 5.24, faithful is he that calleth you. Oh, he is faithful. He never has been unfaithful to me. Second Thessalonians 3 and 3. The Lord is faithful. This coming May, I will have had the baptism of the Holy Ghost 49 years. In this 49 years, He has never failed me. He has never failed me. He has been faithful to me. He has more than kept his end of the bargain. He has never let me down. But he has stood with me, and he has been faithful to me. Yeah, he has been faithful to me. Oh, I can trust him. I can depend upon him. And he's just as constant. He's as constant as nature itself. I was walking along this past week between the uh, World Evangelism Center and the motel, which is a part of the, the complex there, and there's a few drops of rain. I said, we better hurry and get in because it seems like it's fixing to rain. One of the fellows that was walking along beside me, he said, do you know that every year it rains just as much one year as it rains another year? that always there is a certain amount of water that is generated and cycles and falls. It may be divided differently and more fall in one place than fell in another the last year. But every year the same amount comes. Now you can depend on that. There is so much rain going to form and fall upon this earth every year. The Lord has made this world a promise. And He's just simply, as it were, said, I'm going to see to it that you get a certain amount of inch rainfall every year. It may come in different places at different times and unequal amounts. But it's going to come to this earth, and I'll see to it. God is constant in His affairs. You can count on some things happening in nature, and you can also count on some things happening in God. Yes, sir. This is a faithful saying, the Bible said, that Christ Jesus died to save sinners. That is faithful. I don't have to worry about God not saving a sinner. When I tell a person that God will forgive them, 
I never worry about it. I know He will. He never has let a person down that has come to Him in honesty and sincerity. He keeps His promise. He does. He's faithful. God is faithful. God's faithful in supply. I knew uh, quite a few folks when I started living for God. All of us seemed like struggle then, and uh, we just were country people. We didn't know we were really as poor as what we really were, because everybody was like that. But uh, folks were hard workers, and the finest clothes that any of us had was either uh, uh, striped uh, overalls and a white shirt, or it was a suit of khaki pants or a suit of khakis. Now, you didn't work in those khakis. They were your Sunday they, uh, khakis. And so you, you just wore them to church, and you didn't work in them. And uh, that was the kind of life that we lived. I have seen times go, come and go. Forty-nine years has passed since those days. Now, where are those people now that lived like that then? They lived to love God, fear God, and live for God. Well, I could take the Odom boys. They were friends of our family. Those fellows came to the Lord, and, uh, oh, it was, uh, it was hard working times. There was Melvin and O.V. and Winston and Daryl, and uh, oh, none of them had, uh, had a lot of money, just working farmers and so on. Now, are they extremely rich today? No, they are not. But every one of them that I know anything about lived so much better life than they were living when I first met them and when we first got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. God has blessed them and helped them and led them and kept His hand upon them. God is faithful in supply. I believe that. I know that. I can promise that. Yes, I can. Praise God. Well, I think about... A family that I went to church in that little country church. I think about a woman that came leading a couple of boys in to Sunday school. They were chubby, red-faced little fellows, and they were full of vinegar, full of life, and she had her hands full. And I would watch her as she tried to manage those twins. And uh, uh, they, uh, she had her hands uh, full trying to take care of them. And so they grew up. What about those fellows now? I'm thinking of one of them. He is a he is a rich man. He has plenty of money. He draws a tremendous salary as a Delta airline pilot. Beside all of his investments, that country boy, that man, we used to go to church together, and we sat on slat seats, and and man, we were poor, and we were country folks, and so on. What about that guy? And then I think about my own nephew. That was such a good friend of this particular fella, Leon Camel, just a poor, steady fella, just working at what he could. Finally got a, a job with the gas company, and his job was to go out and read the meters in the gas fields and take the pressure readings and uh, do all of that. And so he did that. One day out in the field, he just... Uh, he got to noticing that here was some wellheads, and nobody had done any, there was no activity on those wellheads. They were capped off, had been there for some length of time. And he got to inquiry. They belonged to Louisiana Sulphur Company. And uh, one day, uh, he took the pressure on these uh, wellheads, and to his tremendous <coughs> surprise, there was tremendous gas pressure on these wellheads. Since it was a gas uh, situation, uh, they kept them off, and there they were. So he told his good friend, Ron, and says, uh, what, to, uh, what do you think about that? See, if we could buy those wells, I think that there's some money in that. Ron said, uh, if you say there's that kind of pressure there and so on, and, and uh, I, I say, let's go for it. He said, if you'll furnish the legwork, I don't have time, but if you'll take it in hand and not stop until you work out the details, I'll furnish the money, and uh, we'll, uh, what do you say we buy it? And so he began to work. Folks said, you'll never buy that. Louisiana Supper would never sell that. But he never gave up, and he kept on working at it. And sure enough, in time, they said, we can't sell that to you because that we just can't. But finally they said, 
we will put it up for bids and we'll sell it to the highest bidder. And so they fixed up a place down somewhere for people to come in that wanted to bid and take their own individual pressure readings. But the place that they fixed up was a good long way away from the wellhead. And Leon had taken pressure right at the wellhead previously. And he knew what the reading was. And so uh, they, uh, he, he knew it. And so they put their figures together and they bought those wells. That poor country boy. Yes, sir, my nephew. Time went by and when those things were going uh, at their best, every Sunday that he climbed out of that old pickup truck before that country church in Nova Louisiana and took his children inside to worship God, Leon was $10,000 richer that Sunday than he was the Sunday before. I had up here on this uh, platform not long ago a fellow that I used to pull the crosscut saw with in the tall piney uh, timber. He was bigger than me and older than me, and I was just a kid. I thought my I would break right straight into the coal on that old saw, the sweat coming off my nose, the red bugs, the seed ticks, the yellow jackets, and not a breath of air blowing. And you just tremble and shake and get sick at the stomach and get so hot that you'd take a chill. And uh, there we were, P.V. Well. And I brought him and presented him to this uh, church the other Sunday. And P.V. had this long, drawn-out, slow-talking way of folks way back in Louisiana. But when he came out here, he was driving a mighty fine uh, motor home. Back home, back in Shreveport, he's got a mighty fine home. PV's got plenty of money. Why I'm talking about folks that I went to church with that scratched red bugs and seed ticks and fan with the, uh, funeral fans and things of this nature. I'm telling you that God is faithful. Praise God. He is faithful, praise God. He is faithful, praise God. I'm thinking of some folks that have testified to me sitting in this congregation tonight. And they have told me the struggles of life and the hardships and things of that nature. And they have told me I am so much better off now than I was 15, 20, or 30 years ago. God has been with me. God has helped me. Praise God. He has been with me. Nathaniel was telling me about fellow that spoke to an individual and said, would you like an opportunity to uh, help your brother and uh, give him some money? And obviously this fellow was, he, he had a strong body it looked like, but he was a fellow that didn't care too much for work. And so he was out panhandling and, and uh, he gave this man a wonderful opportunity to be relieved of some of his money. And the man became, was objective, and he said, No, I don't think so. He said, If you're hungry, I'll take you and get you a meal. But I, I don't think that I'd be at liberty just to give you some money. And uh, because I don't know what, what avenue it would be flowing in. And uh, oh, the man said, You are a mighty fine Christian. He said, How dwelleth the love of God in you? Here you are, your brother. The Bible said, if you see your brother in need, and so on, and here I am. I am your brother, and uh, I am in need. And so the gentleman said, I seriously doubt that you are my brother. And he said, don't judge me. And he says, I'm just letting the Word of God judge you. And he says, how can you say that the Word of God would judge me? He said, the Bible said, I was once young, and now I'm old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor God's children begging bread. And said, here you come to me begging. And said, and you tell me that you are a child of God. And the Bible said, I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor God's children begging bread. I'm telling you about something you can depend upon. I believe in the good word of God that God is faithful. Praise God. He is faithful. 
praise God. He is faithful, praise God. We can trust in Him and we can depend upon Him. Hallelujah. We don't always get all that we want, but we will get what we need. God's faithful when it comes to a spiritual help. I uh, was thinking about one time, I was uh, needing to forgive somebody. Have you ever needed to forgive somebody? And uh, so uh, this particular occasion came along, and uh, I, it was a little, uh, it wasn't an easy thing right at that time. And, and then I thought of the Scripture, you forgive till 70 times 7. That's how often that you're supposed to forgive. Seventy times seven. That equals four hundred and ninety times a day. Four hundred and ninety times a day. That is three times every minute. And that is once every twenty seconds. That, uh, could I forgive that man once every twenty seconds? Once uh, uh, ever or three times every minute? Uh, could, I, could I do that? And yet... The Spirit came back to me and said, I wouldn't ask you to do something that I would not do. I would forgive you that often. If you would honestly, truly confess your sins and truly ask my forgiveness, I would do the same for you. For the Bible said, He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. There are some things in God I can depend on, and one of them is His mercy. Oh, what would I do without His mercy? I need His mercy, and I can depend upon His mercy, and I thank God for that. I thank God for that. I'm thinking of a particular family that went away from God, and uh, I wondered why. When I would talk to him, oh, everything is fine. Everything is all right. And he said it in such a way, it was another way of saying, I don't want you crowd me. I don't want you bringing up the subject. I don't want you saying anything more. Just stay off my back. And uh, it's fine, fine, great. And, and so on. And I thought to myself, what, why? Here we are, we break our back and we break our heart to furnish the best kind of ministry and bring in the finest preachers and to minister here. And we try to be kind and we try to be considerate and we try to do all of these things. And when that particular man had somebody that was beating and banging around on him all the time and was making it rough on him and he never did enough good, always on his back about something, then he lived for God. And here I kind to him, and, and, and all of that, and look, uh, he's going to go away from God, and so on. But so he did, but what happened? What did God do? God, he said, though we be unfaithful, yet he abides faithful. Every night he gives that family a good sleep. Every day he can breathe. Every day he can walk because God is faithful to him. You, I might not have always kept my end of the bargain, but God has always kept his part of it. He has never been untrue to me. He has been faithful to me. Praise God. Faithful to me. You've got great examples of faithfulness, not only in the Lord, then other things too. Jesus lived a faithful life. Among everything else, we talk about His miracles and all. We don't say much about His faithfulness. But He lived a faithful life. When His parents came and said, Son, said, we've really sorry for you. We looked for you three days. We found you. And uh, what was the response? The Bible tells us that Jesus went back home with Mary and Joseph and obey them. And yet here is Jesus Christ, the God of the universe in human flesh, that went home and was subject to a couple of peasant people. There was Mary and Joseph. They were ignorant in a lot of ways, but they had a clean and an honest heart. And he was subject unto them. He was faithful. He, there were some principles that were just that way, and he submitted himself to them. 
The disciples were faithful people. Only one died, as far as we know, is a natural death, and that was John. And the church founders were faithful. Praise God. Sister MacDaniel, would you stand up? And would you remain standing? We appreciate so much this, this lady, and her husband appreciates her, and we thank God for her, and so on. How come that this person is saved today and living for God? Because of two poor, honest-hearted people living in Artesia that felt like God wanted them to go to Pecos and build a church. Hired somebody on a flatbed truck to haul their goods. All that Brother Lewis had was two dollars, and he gave it to the man for gas money, and he hauled his stuff down to Pecos. And uh, when he got in Pecos, he didn't have nothing to buy any food with. And this was the beginning of the church in Pecos, and in that church... Our dear sister received the baptism of the Holy Ghost because that somebody was faithful. I thank God. Thank you, sister. I thank God that my heritage has a good, solid base to it. I can point to people that are real heroes that live by principle instead of convenience, that knew what it was to be to suffer and to go hungry. Praise God. And yet they were faithful. One of the most wonderful things I can remember about my mother was that Lucy Sanderson was faithful. I could count on her. Oh, the, the hardship of it all. And yet we could count on her. There are older saints in this church that have been faithful, that have stood in there and stayed steady. Thank God. Hallelujah. I'd like for those folks that are here tonight that have had the Holy Ghost 30 years and longer, I'd like for you to stand. Glory. <laughs> well, while we're at it, let Sister Callus and Sister Parrish come up here. Praise God. The rest of you folks be seated. Hallelujah. Let's all say faithful. Faithful. Let's say it again. Faithful. And so this particular man I'm talking about, he told me, he said, it doesn't matter what time she gets in at night. She'll get up and fix my breakfast and she's smiling. Come in there and sit down at the table and be smiling too. And she says, Oh, I'm here. I'm cooking your breakfast as always. Only thing wrong, I'm just not faithful. Well, that does make a difference. Praise God. Hallelujah. We love you folks. And these folks are standing here tonight, and I'd, I'd just like for them to say a word for the Lord. Sister Callis, we love you. She and her husband built a building and invited a preacher to come 50 years ago. <clears throat> and this was the beginning of the first United Pentecostal Church in Odessa. Say a word for the Lord. Well, it has been great to live for the Lord, but there's no other life to live, only to live for the Lord. And I'm so thankful that the Lord spoke to our hearts to, to build a church for, uh, for Him, for His name's sake. There was churches there, but not for His name's sake. And I'm so glad that the Lord dealt with us to do that. And I love the Lord. And it has been a pleasure in my life to live for the Lord. There's no other way to live, only to live for the Lord. For He's great, and He is greatly to be praised. Praise God. The Lord's been real good to me. I was thinking, uh, Brother Massengale was my pastor. And I remember one time, he, uh, whenever I was seeking the Holy Ghost, he said that he had fasted three days for some of us that were seeking the Lord. And he looked so weak and tired, and I thought, oh, you sorry, no good thing. If you can't uh, get in and really be honest and true 
and really get the Holy Ghost, what are you coming up here for? Now, that's exactly what I thought. And then the Lord, I guess, saw my heart and I got the Holy Ghost. But every time I see Brother Massendale, I think, bless his old heart. He was, a, he was such a good pastor. And, of course, I've got one of the best now, and I love all you folks. And we're glad tonight to have Grandpa and Grandma with us. <clears throat> they, they, they finish out our church family, <clears throat> and they add so much to it. And they say that a family is not complete without grandparents. Praise God. And we're so thankful for you. Praise God. Sister Massengale, it was great to see you here tonight. I'm glad that you got to come. Say a word for the Lord. Brother Pugh, I'm so happy to be here, and I miss it so much when I can't be. And I get my spiritual growth here and my spiritual food, and i got to have it. i got to have it to make it. And I love the Lord, and I love you and Sister Pugh so very much. And I love this church family. Praise the Lord. And I want Brother Massengale to come to the platform and, uh, and sing a song for us here in just a bit. Praise God. Now, if this was in some churches, we'd be in bad shape right now because we would have shot the program and gone off of the, our format. But here, praise God, who cares? Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Now, while Brother Massengale's getting ready to sing, I want to say this. Our motives for faithfulness can vary. We can have different reasons. We can have selfish reasons. Revelation 2 and 10, the promise was, I'll give you a crown of life. Now, a person can want to go and, and live for God simply because the streets of gold, the crown of life, things of this nature, and what I'm going to get out of it. Uh, that can be a selfish reason. Jacob said, Lord, if you'll go with me and keep me, whithersoever I'll go, and keep me safe from harm, and bring me back to this place, I'll tell you what I'll do, God. I, I'm really going to really strike a bargain with you. I'll give you 10% of what I make if, if you'll just do that, and so on. Now, that's fine. That was great for Jacob to pay tithes and all, but we should pay tithes simply because it's right. Not because of what we get out of it. We never get any remuneration simply because it's right. Because the good Word of God teaches it. Somebody says it's under the law. Well, it was before the law. Because Abraham paid tithes in an order that was higher than that of Aaron. He paid tithes in Melchizedek. And Paul said that Melchizedek abides forever. The high priest of God. This was an order, friend, that had no, no ending. It was one that was superseded even the law of Moses. Some people are faithful because of a sense of debt. Psalm 6, 116 says, What shall I bring before the Lord? And what shall I come before him with? And David answered, he said, I'll take the cup of salvation and I will pay my vows because I'm rendering this unto the Lord because of all of his benefits unto me. But it's better to be faithful simply because it's right to be faithful. It's just simply right to be faithful. I said a while ago that the heroes of my life were the people that I pastored. And I have a great illustrious list of heroes in my memory tonight. Let me bring up one here tonight. The grandfather of Sister Cruy, Ben MacDonald. The MacDonald family is a family that we pastored over a long period of time. Not just a professional uh, relationship, but they were very dear friends of ours. Ben worked at Texaco Refinery. Ben McDonald was a praying man. And he stood by me. I was 27 years old when I came to be his pastor. And I made lots of mistakes. But he prayed for me. He stood by me. And when I had a particular need, all I needed to say was, Brother McDonald, I've got to make a decision tomorrow. And I, as of yet, don't know which way it's going to go. If you would remember to pray for me, I'd appreciate it. 
it would not be an unusual thing for Ben McDonald to go to that old wooden church on 16th Street and spend the entire night in prayer and not come out of there until the morning hours. He was faithful in his attendance. He was faithful in his uh, financial support. He was faithful in his praying. And that wasn't all. He was faithful on his job. Friend, Ben was on his job when he was supposed to be on his job. Ben took care of his responsibilities. Ben was faithful. He was faithful to his wife. They moved to Austin. And and Sister May, the best chicken dumpling maker that you could ever imagine. She got, they both got old, and, and she became senile. Ben was an industrious fellow, and though he was retired, he did jobs that he could find, and which had to do with mowing and taking care of people's lawns. There was his wife. She would just go out the door and go, and they didn't know what, they couldn't find her, and, and he had to take care of her. So he would take May with him. He would set her under a tree or on the edge of the porch, and Ben would mow in the hot sun. Perspire, watch me, go and bring her water and see if everything is all right with her. And finally, May got to where she couldn't uh, get out of bed, and she was uh, just out of it. Ben never went to another bed. He said, this is my wife. She and I have slept together all these years just because that she is not responsible. I'm going to be right by her side because it seems like she's quieter if I sleep with her. And so in the night, he was there. May, honey, anything you want. And Ben was faithful. And then May MacDonald died. And the family called us from Austin and said, Brother Pugh, if you would help in the funeral, I was so glad to. I went down. And there we spoke, and there was the family that I'd loved and pastored for all of this time. And then something happened to Ben. His mind began to go too, and he got up older. And then one day he came to visit in Odessa. Sister Cruz's dad brought him over, Titus, and brought uh, Brother Ben MacDonald over to the house. And we had some visiting, and then they, they got ready to leave. And my wife said to Brother MacDonald, she said, uh, Brother MacDonald, why don't you just stay with us? And uh, we'd be glad to have you stay with us. No, Sister Pew, he said, said, I've got to get back. Said, you know, I've got to go see about me. And said, she needs somebody and somebody's got to take care of me. May had been dead, may have been buried for some time, but deep inside of that good man was that position of faithfulness. 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 I'm sorry that today we live in a generation that's a throwaway situation, a lot of them. Living by convenience and so on. But oh, thank God, there are people in this church who live by principle, who you can count on, people that are faithful, people that are dependable. You can predict them. Praise God. Job's wife came to him one time and put this question to him and said, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Man, alive, it doesn't pay to live for God no more. Look, your houses are gone, your children are gone, they're all dead. Curse God and die. He said, Woman, you speak as a foolish woman. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Praise God. Praise God. One of the greatest assurances that your children live for God is that there is a steady, dependable faithfulness in that home. I wanted to live in such a way before my children that they would say, Dad lives what he preaches. If he preaches one thing, he does it. I didn't want them to ever say, he preaches against watching TV, but when we go on vacation or we get in a motel, Dad will turn it on and Dad will stand there and look at it. I didn't want them to ever say that. I have wanted to be a faithful dad. Praise God. I want to be. I want to be. 
Let's all say faithful. Faithful. Let's say it again. Faithful. Let's say it again. Faithful. And the Bible said, Blessed is that person that can swear to his own hurt and change not. I like that. It's another way of saying, My word is my bond. If I told you that I would do that, I'll do my best to do that. Or I'll tell you the reason why I just simply couldn't. You can depend on that. So, there is a tremendous difference between a crowd of people and a real church that's solid, that's got principle right in the heart of it. Praise God. And lives accordingly. Brother Massingale, praise God. This preacher just almost scares you to death, doesn't he? That word faithful just scares me. Uh, now, I thought this. If Brother Pugh could pull his shoes off in the hospital, I can pull my shoes off in this church, can't I? If I <laughs> you know, my socks was wrinkled, too. <laughs> Isn't this a great man? You know why I'm here with you as a former pastor? I don't think I could do this anywhere I've ever been. Really, I don't. You have, for a past, or say we have, for a pastor, one of the greatest men that I've ever known in my life. And, of course, now I have grown old, and I'm a whole lot like David. I've, I've never been forsaken of God. He has blessed my hand in so many ways. When I needed a job, he gave me a job. And I want to say this in, in regards to, to faithful on the job. At least three letters I have received from superintendents on jobs I have been. And I'm not saying this boastfully, but I, I would say it in regards to young men especially, or anyone that is holding down a job, be faithful on that job. And I told one of my colleagues just recently, I'm 77 years old, this past August the 6th. I have had many jobs in my lifetime. And I'm not saying this boastfully, but never been fired off of a job in 77 years. And I think that's a record. And I think that that could just help you, you know, uh, be faithful on that job. Uh, do the job in such a way that you can leave it in good graces with your bosses. And Brother Hasher remembers me uh, working on a job with him. That superintendent gave me a marvelous recommendation, and I did appreciate that. And you folks, uh, when you speak uh, in reverence to my past, uh, pastorate here, of course it gladdens my heart. Of course I have sweet memories of the past, as well as you. And I remember how God blessed you and blessed me with you so greatly. How could you forget when the altars would be filled and uh, altars would be just uh, actually bathed with tears? I hated to see that old altar, Brother Pew, go because it actually had memories uh, to all of us old-timers, we remembered how people actually wept and prayed around those altars and received God. This is a great church. This is a great people. And we love you. We just love you so greatly. And I, I just appreciate so much your pastor inviting me in. I didn't come in, just stomp in here and say I'm coming to this church. He invited me. He's been good to me as though he was my father. I just so appreciate him so greatly. And what I, what I appreciate him uh, mostly is that I know you people love him. And when we, uh, he praises upon him, I feel like that he wears the same size hat when he leaves under, the, under those praises as he did when he came. And that's, that's just marvelous. If you have a talent and you portray that talent, and God blesses you with that talent, go away wearing the same size hat. And you'll make it with God. 
Don't ever get puffed up. Don't ever get... Brother Abbott one time, uh, as he left the pulpit, uh, some fellow met him and said, Brother Abbott, I believe that is about the best sermon I ever heard you preach. And he went away praying and said, God, don't let me get puffed up. And when he went to the, uh, to the back, another fellow met him and says, Brother Abbott said, I believe that is about the sorrowest message I ever heard you preach. <laughs> then he went away and says, God, don't let me get puffed down. <laughs> If you knew Brother Habit, he, he'd just like that. Well, now, you know, this is just a church that has fun, and we, we live together like a family. And I'm glad I'm your grandpa. I'm really glad I am. I'm not ashamed of that. God bless you, Brother Pew. We love you.
say. 